Yes, thank you. We are recording as we speak. Yes, we are now thank recording. you so much. Okay. So everybody, and, and me, uh, just a minute here, I'm gonna put this up here on top. So you're okay, right? Yeah, I'm okay, thank you. All right, now, um, this is not about today's lecture. This is two slides that I failed to emphasize uh, last time when I was talking about the geothermal site. I showed you this same slide to emphasize that the malaise trap is sitting right here on the edge all the time that the platform is cleared, developed, the drilling goes in, and then they finish, and then they go away. Now, what I didn't tell you about this slide is in the next slide, you also, oops, now it's not going forward. Hmm. Let's see what's wrong here. Just to back there. Okay. The next slide you've also seen, but later on in the lecture. And this was a map, this was a graph of the species, how many species of insects were caught by the malaise trap each week as we went through the whole year. So these are different individual traps down here. They're all basically saying the same thing. And then there's this one trap that's way out of line up here, which turned out to be on the edge of the platform. Now, what I failed to point out to you was this blue line here represents the time that all the serious drilling activity was going on, the lights, the noise, the diesel, the people, the vehicles, all those things. And there's no footprint of that blue line reflected in these results from the traps. In other words, the, the drilling activity itself, all of that did not impact any part of the system it comes down, it's declining during the dry season. Then when the rains start, it goes way up like this. And then after they laid their eggs and died, it goes way down to here. And the immatures are growing and growing and emerging over here. And finally, the population goes back up again, just like it was back up over here at the beginning of the dry season. Then this will be the beginning of the next dry season. So we have a normal pattern here. We have the same normal pattern with all of these other traps with a sm smaller bump here big bump up here, but a smaller bump here. So the point is that these are all over saying the same thing. And there, this is a bigger reflection of that. But the drilling process, which takes place all through here from the dry season, all during the time of the rain starting, and this is the rain here. Remember, these are the amounts of rainfall falling. Um, and then during this time of year, out, out into here, no impact at all. So the point being is that the drilling itself, which is what everybody thought would be the worst thing, is not the worst thing. The worst thing, if you had to think worst, is the clearing, the opening, not the activity that takes place in the opening from the viewpoint of the insects. What we knew from the viewpoint of the mammals that we watched is that they, by the large, are not willing, the jaguars, the mountain lions, the peccaries are not willing to walk across the platform while there's all this activity going on during this blue line. But as soon as you get to it up here or afterwards over here, they don't pay any attention. It's just a dry riverbed from their standpoint. They just walk right across the bare, walk right across the bare open ground, just like they would walk across a dry riverbed running through the forest. Okay, that's the remnant from a previous lecture about geothermal uh, that I wanted to emphasize that I failed to tell you about. Then. Now, today, what we're focusing on is courtship and mating by plants. Now, you don't normally think of that. You think of pollination or um, seed setting, uh, things like that, uh, fruits, uh, mature, seed mature, um, but uh, in fact, it's the same process as courtship and mating by animals. It's just done slightly differently. But the verbs are basically the same. It's the nouns that are different. And um, the basic object that a plant uses for this process is a flower. 
And um, this is the this is a, just an example of a cross section through a flower where I've removed the petals so you can see what's inside of this tubular flower. Um, now the first thing are these petals that you see the brightly colors, yellows, whites, all those kinds of things, blue that you're used to seeing uh, as petals on a flower. Those are all modified leaves. So the plant has taken a leaf and evolved it to be an attractive device. It's also to protect the pollen, which you see right here, from rain. Okay, so I'm gonna get my pointer out here in just a minute. There we go. The pollen that's on these little bags right here, these are little bags of pollen right here called anthers. Uh, those are, are, the pollen is quite rain, rain susceptible. It can be damaged by rain. So these petals are also protecting that pollen as well as um, protecting, as well as attracting things and guiding the animal who comes to this to get in here and go by this. And this thing right here is the stigma. The green thing you see here is the stigma and that's sticky. And that's where the pollen sticks to it normally or commonly coming from another flower who's contaminated the bat or the butterfly the beetle, the wasp, the fly, whatever it is, who was attracted to the flower has got pollen grades on it because it went into another flower. And so it sheds those onto the sticky thing here. So that pollen grain then germinates and the cells grow down all the way, all the way, all the way down here to this thing right here, which is the ovule. That will become the fruit down the line and the seeds are inside of that. Okay. Now, there's a green area right here. And here's another piece of it here, another piece of it here that are wrapped around this area. Those are called sepals, S-E-P-A-L-S. -E and they are just basically protection from getting animal, animals getting here to get the young fruit and the young ovules, the young seeds in here. So the whole structure, male and female, because the pollen grains, of course, are male, basically. Um, and the female part, which is the thing of the um, pistol here for receiving the uh, uh, other pollen, is all structured inside this one thing. Now, in the evolution of flowers, in some cases, the female function is completely gone. So the male, the flower is only a male flower. It only hangs pollen. There's others where the, the uh, male function is completely gone. And so there's only a stigma out here that can be then pollinated. Here's another example this is a cactus flower. Um, it's about eight inches long from here to here. So here are the sepals out in here and they were all protective of the whole flower bud in the beginning and now they're still protecting. They keep animals from going in back here. But here is where the animals go in, the white front. And the white petals are the white that you see there. That's what it looks like from the front. And here, here are all the pollen, the all the, <coughs> the anthers with pollen in them here. And here's the stigma down here, the sticky thing. And so you see the thing is set up so that when the animal comes in and goes down into here to get nectar, the pollen grains it's carrying first get stuck to this. It goes down in here, does its thing getting nectar, the reward, and backs out, and as it comes out, it gets all the pollen grains put on it. So when it goes to the next flower, it's ready to pollinate that flower. And incidentally, I just used the word pollinate. Pollinate means to put the pollen on this stigma. Visiting a flower is visiting the flower. And there are a number of ways that an animal can visit this flower without doing pollination. In other words, it may be carrying pollen, but it could enter the wrong way. It doesn't contact the sticky stigmas here, they're actually pollinated. This is looking at it from the side. So here are the anther filaments, these things here, and here's the anthers out here at the end, and here's the stigma out here beforehand. This entire flower is constructed for one night. In other words, all the resources that have gone into making this flower, I say eight or 10 inches long, are only there used for that one night that it also, of course, puts a relative importance on this single flower. Here's one sliced open. 
So if you follow it all the way down to the base, this is where the nectar is produced. It's down here. So the animal has to have a tongue it can reach all the way down into here to get the nectar, the reward. This is, of course, a way of keeping animals with short tongues from getting to it. So they aren't the pollinators. The pollinators for this flower, for example, here's an old fashioned roll of film, incidentally, for scale. Technology doesn't function these days. Um, but here's an example. This is one of the moths I work with. And look at the tongue, the length of the tongue. Now, this particular moth, this one you see right here, is from Madagascar. Uh, I've never worked in Madagascar, so that's obviously not my photograph. But here is the one from Costa Rica, which equally has a very long tongue and does the same thing as the one from Madagascar. This one goes to an orchid with a very, very long nectar tube in Madagascar. Well, this one in Costa Rica goes to an orchid, which is right here, with a very, very long nectar tube. Look at the length of that thing. That's about nine inches from there to there. So what has happened is this moth hovers in front of this flower and sticks that very long tongue all the way down into here to get nectar. Here's the tongue coiled up underneath the head. So this is an eye right here. Um, and uh, this is the coiled up tongue while it's just flying around somewhere. So here's what it looks like in a, in a drawing. But of course, the thing to notice is this moth here, taxonomically, is not related to this moth. So this trait has been evolved independently in Africa and the New World. They're not, they're not in the same genus. They are in the same family, Syngidae, but they're not related. Yet look how similar they appear to each other. You see these two black lines right here? Where's the black line? There's the black line. There's the black line right there. The yellow orange right here, the yellow orange here. The slightly bare area right here on the hind wing. There it is there again. There it is there again. The spots on the abdomen, spots on the abdomen. Same body shape, same wing shape, all this. So what's happened is we've taken two different animals and evolved them towards the same traits, morphological traits of its body in response to being a pollinator for plants who look like this. Now that's one way, that's nectar. Right here on this flower, you see a, a thing right here on it, that's a bee. What the bee is doing is grabbing a hold of the anther, which is the yellow thing you see right here, and buzzing the wings on its back. So the whole bee vibrates like you had, um, taking a salt shaker and held it in your hand and shaking it violently and the salt comes out. Well, that's what the bee does, but the pollen comes out to hit it on its stomach, on its belly, on the underside. So if we take that bee, we turn it, uh, well, here's another one, and you can see the little holes at the end of these anthers, but you notice that the stigma is sitting out here. So the bee contacts the stigma first, coming in with pollen from other one, and then it gets more out of these anthers right here. If we turn that bee over, here's his abdomen, the wings, oh, sorry, the wing there, wing here, the legs. Look at all the pollen stuck on the underside of the bee. It has shaken all that pollen out of the flower. So this bee visits the pollen, the flower to get pollen, not nectar. So it, the, the, the plant is feeding it, effectively feeding it sperm as the attractant for this bee to go and do the stuff. So what's the bee do with that pollen? Well, here's a road cut in where I am in Costa Rica and rainforest. And we go right over here to the edge of the bank, right, right here on this side. And here's a, a pile of dirt on the side of the bank. And here's a bee head right there. That bee has made a tunnel. And this is the dirt that is kicked out of the tunnel to make its nest back inside the road cut. So I'll take my knife out and scrape my way in to see what is inside. And here is the cell that the bee has made inside with its ball of pollen 
glued together with nectar from a different flower, a flower that uses nectar to attract the bees as opposed to pollen to attract the bees, and laid one egg on it. So here's the egg on the pollen ball, and the larva of the bee is now going to eat that ball of pollen for its development. Now, when I say bee, bee, e, e, I'm referring to the hundreds and thousands of species of solitary bees around the world. Honeybees, which you think of as a bee, are extraordinarily abnormal. They are, they are to mammals what humans are to mammals. We're very peculiar mammals. Honeybees are very peculiar bees. But wild bees have this kind of biology over and over and over again. This is a different one. In this case, instead of being dug out of a bank, the female bee, the mother, has made a cell, which I've now popped the top off of. So here's the top over here. That's this is where it sealed it in, out of resin, which she has collected from other plants. Fill it with pollen, which you see here, put the egg down on it, close it up with this top that was flipped over here. And the larva then is developed eating that pollen. So it's the original couch potato. You can see, I mean, it doesn't even really have functional feet or functional legs. It just sits there and snarfs up all this pollen. And in fact, eats all of this without defecating. And at the very end, when it's ready to pupate, it lays one big turd called a meconium which it then throws out of the cell or parks off to one side of the cell. So it's, it's a biology adapted to having your mother make this huge chunk of food for you and then just plunk you down on it. This is after it's now eaten all the pollen. So now it's sitting there fully mature, ready to make a pupa, which will then produce an adult bee, which looks like this. Here's the pupa over here. You see here the, the legs, the wings, the pink eyes just starting out, the antenna, all of that is going to then shed that skin and turn black. And here's the adult bee over here. Now I've broken the, the cell apart. So here's pieces of the cell like pottery around here on the side. These are carpenter bees that make a tunnel not in dirt. They don't make a wax cell or a resin cell. They drill into wood. And they're right here on campus. You could be sitting on one of the old wooden benches on campus and have a big black bee that looks like this. It's about the size of your thumbnail. Hover in the air in front of you while you're sitting there having lunch or taking notes or whatever. That's a male looking for the female who will have drilled into the wood underneath you. And she will be inside the tunnel. And he's waiting for her to come out, try to get a copulation. So that's his way of courtship. And if you look closely at him as he hovers in front of you, because you're sitting right on top of this cell, and there'll be a hole in the, in the wood right underneath you. You look closely at him and he has a white face. The females are all black. The male has a white face. So the male can recognize the female and they can recognize each other. So you will periodically see fights between two males in the air in front of you over the spot to hover in front of the nest. Now, the pollen that gets back, part of it is just contaminated pollen on the outside that serves as pollination. But many of these have evolved very specific ways of carrying pollen. See the very fine, has a bee lying on its back. Very fine hairs on the legs. Very, very fine, very, very fine here. This is close up. All the yellow are very small pollen grains stuck between those hairs. And the hairs are positioned such that when a pollen grain gets pushed between two of them, they're pushing tightly against it and they hold it. So this is like a, a big, very, very finely developed brush, which you fill with pollen grains which are just the right width, so they get stuck between the hairs. And then it takes this back to the nest. Now, these are the honeybees that you know. Okay? So they don't look at all like what we've been looking at. But let's take one of those guys and look at him on a flower. Here's the honeybee. 
And right here on the hind leg is in fact a big spoon-shaped flat depression called a scopa, if, if you want a word for it, S-C-O-P-A. And this honeybee has been a collecting a, a, a goldenrod pollen with its legs and then packing it with nectar onto this. So you get a big lump of sticky material here, like earwax or oatmeal. Um, that's how it's carrying it. So it's not carrying it inside of hairs. It's carrying it by having a special, if you like, shallow basket onto which it can pack that pollen. Now then things get really exotic when you start going to other animals. This is a fly, obviously. And um, right here under the fly's nose are these uh, yellow sacs. Each one of those sacs has in it, let's just say, 20,000 pollen grains, very, very small. And it got stuck there when this, bee, this, this fly went into an orchid to get nectar. And the orchid has a special little set of morphology which sticks, glues this pouch right there. And the ultimate male flower of the orchid on another plant has got like a fork-like structure that grabs a hold of those little pollen sacs and pulls them off. So if you look, got 20,000 pollen grains in there, that means the fruit that comes from being pollinated might have 20,000 seeds in it, but each one is excruciatingly small. We'll talk about that in a bit. This is another way of carrying pollen. It's obviously a butterfly. Here's the tongue, like you saw the tongue rolled up for the, uh, the sphinx moth with a very long tongue that went into the flower. Well, this guy doesn't have an exceptionally long tongue because that's only three, four inches long, something like that. But it sticks it down into the flower, gets it sticky with nectar, and then wipes it on the pollen. The pollen glues itself to this long tongue. Then the butterfly coils it up in the mass you see here regurgitates nectar into a pollen mass. The proteins and sugars in the pollen leach into the nectar. So it's a partial digestion. And then it sucks the nectar up. So this butterfly never eats pollen. What it does is eat this enriched nectar, which is made by soaking the nectar from a flower in pollen grains. Now here's how further you can carry this kind of stuff. Here's the social bee nest over here. It's made by a small species of bees. See, little bees here, a little one there. They're not very big. They're I mean, a quarter inch long, something like that. And here's a very large bee. This is bigger than any bumblebee you've ever seen. It's almost two inches long. It's hovering in the air in front of this nest, which is made of resin collected from a tree. This guy is stealing the resin and carrying it in the scopa of that spoon-like structure on the hind leg in order to take it back and build its own nest. So instead of going collecting this from, from tree trunks, which is what these little bees did, they do that. This guy comes and steals, or this gal, I should say, this is only for females. This gal goes and steals this resin from here, packs it into the place that she would normally carry pollen to take back to the nest, and takes this back to grow a nest. Now, those are animals. And we can think and imagine what the other ones will look like, the bat pollinated ones, the pollen gets stuck somewhere on the bat, its nose, its legs, its wings, hummingbirds, the same thing. Um, so the, these things all for animals, but there's of course a huge amount of wind pollination. There's nothing to do with mammals at all or animals at all. This is a male plant. So all the anther filaments are, the stem, sorry, the bases of the flowers are very, very, very long. And then the, the um, uh, pollen grains are in these sacks right here. They're hanging out in the wind so that as the wind goes through forcefully, it picks up the pollen grains, which you end up calling the result of, of uh, hay fever, okay? So these guys are spewing very large quantities of pollen. And of course, the vast majority of those pollen grains never hit a female flower. So they just fall into the litter and they become more organic uh, debris that's eaten by other animals. 
This is what the female looks like for the same species of plant. See, now we have a very short stem here. And then we have these little stigmas right here. They are picking the pollen grains out of the air. It's a pine tree. You recognize a pine cone right there. But that's the female part of the pine tree. This is going to make the seeds. Now, there's a time when these cone scales open up enough so that windborne pollen can get in between the scales and actually pollinate the ovule that's inside. The same tree has male flowers, which are here. So all this yellow that you see in between here is the fine grains of wind dispersed pollen from the pine tree. Now notice that this is below the female. So the wind will carry this away. You see, if this guy here, if this pollen, if this male flower was up here, when it produced pollen, the pollen grain would just fall straight down to here and you'd end up with self-pollination, which most female, well, most plants reject. Not all, but many, many do. So what would happen, what happens is you put it down lower than the female flowers, the wind then carries it off horizontally and ends up on some other pine tree. So in other words, these, the female flower here and the male flower here are not just there by accident. They're not just sort of in any place. Now, this is the top of a corn plant. I think you probably all of you have seen this at some time in your life. And uh, here the pollen grains are being produced by the anthers, which you see right up here like this. And um, below them on the plant are the stigmas, which is each one of these connects to one kernel on the corn cob. So the corn cob is down here. Each one of these stigmas is attached to one kernel in the corn cob. But this is down low. And this is up high. So why doesn't this thing just self-pollinate? Because all the after the pollen's released here, it would just fall straight down. The reason why is that these anthers are not, these stigmas are not receptive yet. So at the time that the at the time that the pollen is being produced up here, it's being carried off by the wind, and later on these stigmas are receptive. So they've got to get pollen from some other plant simply because it doesn't make its own pollen at the time when the stigmas are in fact receptive. So now the positioning can be any way you like. And um, here is a bee which is harvesting this pollen. Now, if you were an entomologist, that sentence would sound wrong to you. Because if you were an entomologist, you would know that bees don't eat grass pollen and corn is a grass. Corn bees can't even live on, on, uh, on, on, uh, on grass pollen. If you give them large quantities of it, they can't feed their kids if the kids starve to death. So what's this bee doing collecting pollen? That's a social bee. Social bees have much broader food tolerances and food abilities than do solitary bees. Because a social bee, which has a nest with many individuals, has to last all year long. So different times of the year, different foods are available. So it, it can, it's much more of a generalist. Whereas the solitary bees are specialists on doing all kinds of weird things to get their different kinds of food. And second, they only have to be active during a certain portion of the year. The rest of the time, they're dormant, pupae or larvae in a nest underground, inside of wood, inside of a, a nest constructed by the female bee, and so on. Now, let's move on to the flowers as a whole. This is um, 2,000 meter elevation in the French Alps. Okay, there's a person out here for scale. It's a pretty grim landscape. Obviously, it's been glaciated and it's very cold and, and um, for, no forest left because the glaciers have, have just scraped it off. Uh, the winter is very severe. Uh, here we are in the summertime, however, out in here. 
And uh, so we walk through this. Now, I mean, I'm just walking through it in a line. Anytime I see a flower, I take a picture. I think this was like July, it was definitely the middle of the summer. So there's, you see, there's a plant that survives in this kind of system, little tiny plant that makes flowers now. Here's another one. There's another one. There's another one. There's another one. Another one. Another one, another one, another one. Now, we go to Costa Rica, 2,000 meters elevation, also cold and wet. Of course, first off, you notice that there's a whole lot of forest, which there's not in the French Alps at 2,000 meters, nothing like this. But here's an open spot over here, cleared for a cornfield by some farmer. It's another one over here. Another one over here. So we have both forest and open areas. So now I walk through this forest and on the edges of the open area, the, the, the center part is too intensively cultivated so there's anything there at all. Um, but the edges and the forest itself. And I take picture of everything I see. You see the difference between this set of photographs and the previous set of photographs? The previous set of colorists had no red flowers. This one had a lot of red flowers. And if you took the hundreds of species of plants that live in both places and add them all up, this one, this one here in Costa Rica would have 25%, 35% red flowers. I mean, 25, 35% of them would have red flowers. The ones in Europe, none. Now in somebody's garden where they've been introduced from the new world, that's a whole different matter. But we're talking about really a contrast, a flower level contrast between the old world and the new world. The difference between this set of flowers and the previous one we looked at from France is that. Hummingbirds are entirely new world. And they have selected for their long bills and their high sensitivity to red, which is either evolved for the flowers or the flowers evolved for them. We can't really know or the two together. Selecting for red tubular flowers. So this little guy here is visiting those flowers to get nectar. For a long time, everybody kind of thought, well, that's what they eat. But when you find hummingbird nest and you look at the kids and you watch what the moms bring to the kids, you discover that she's not filling them up with sugar water. She's filling them up with insects, spiders taken out of their webs, insects caught in flowers. So they're getting a high protein diet. But then you begin to wonder where is she getting her proteins? Well, there was a, a, a professor pair at Berkeley back when I was a graduate student who went out and got the sugar water out of these flowers, the nectar from these flowers, and analyzed them and discovered that the red tubular flowers have nectar, which is jacked up by amino acids, proteins. So when mom eats that nectar, she's not just getting sugar water. She's getting sugar water with a whole lot of protein stacked in it. Whereas the others, the bee flowers, the things that are visible like flies and bees and things like that, they have their own alternate foods, uh, protein sources. So their nectar is much closer to sugar water. So those bees that you were seeing, they were all getting their proteins out of the pollen grains, not out of the nectar. Whereas these guys are getting the, their proteins directly out of the nectar. Now they probably eat some of those insects that they bring to the kids. I wouldn't be surprised at that, but I, nobody's ever been able to even try to show that. So here we go again. But now we're in the understory of the forest focused on these red things. They have very different shapes. But they're often tubular in some way or another. So the only way you can get into them 
is that that long bill reached down inside. These are flags that say that under this leaf, there's a red tubular flower. Now, why is that underneath? Whereas the red spots are out here on the tip of the leaf because it rains all the time in this forest. So this is a way of protecting the flowers from the rain. You hide them underneath the umbrella, but you put a flag outside that says it's there. Now, what happened to me was, is this, sorry, wrong direction here, is we were by the side of the road in 1965, and I had a botanist with me. And we stopped the roadside, and there was one of these bright red flowers that he wanted to collect for the herbarium. So I stopped the car, got out. He walked over to the plant, cut the flowering stem off, and put it in the car. Then he said he wanted to go off on the forest and see if he could find any more. So I said, OK, I'll see you in a half an hour. So he goes away. So I'm just stuck by the car looking at insects and taking some pictures. And while I'm standing there, one of these guys comes zipping in and hovers right where the flowers were. And then landed on a little twig and looked all over the place, and upwards, backwards, forwards, all around, and then flew away. 15 minutes later, the same or another one came and did exactly the same thing. Now, I grew up trapping animals and you have a trap line or you have a series of traps that you scattered out through the marsh or the forest or wherever it is. And you run down the trap line, checking them to see if any one of them has caught something. That's because you know where each one of those traps is and you revisit it over and over again. And as I watched this bird looking where that flower had been, I suddenly realized, whoa, he's trap lining. That bird knows where this was. He probably has 20 or 30 other ones out there in the forest. He knows where everyone is. And he just goes around visiting them at some interval. And during that interval, the nectar builds back up in the flower. This keeps the flower, this, the flower then is training the hummingbird to itself. And the hummingbird is, has a, basically a, a feeding route or a territory or a trap line that it in fact defends from other Birds. This has now been found to be actually the case. That's what these birds do. And that's very different from a different kind of pollination, which we'll come to later on. Um, but the point being that this animal is not a little robot, a little, you know, a little silly thing that doesn't know what it's doing and just attracted to a red flower. It knows where those, re those source food sources are. And furthermore, when you look at the plants, you discover that many of those plants produce one flower every day. So this thing has a, this is a newly opening one right here. So by the end of the day, it will have dropped off this. And tomorrow, a bud like this one right here will poke out and open up and be available to the bee, to the hummingbird. This thing here is a passiflora. The hummingbird sticks its bill down through this toothbrush to get nectar. And in the process, the pollen grains, which are under, underneath these three anthers, go on the top of the hummingbird's head. And in the process, this, this flower is only good for one day. So it makes all the flower, gets pollinated, or doesn't get pollinated. And if it doesn't get pollinated, it just drops off, wilts, and it's gone. So on, so forth. Make one more of these. One, one that comes out one day, and this is tomorrow's bud right here. Now, that's a hummingbirds, but I want to show you the biology of a different solitary bee living in the same kind of forest. These are students in a class looking for bee nests on the ground. This is me finding one nest. Here's the, here's the dirt kicked up by the female bee. Here, here she is just returning to the, uh, the hole. I think, I think this, this is the hole, I think, right here, or maybe it's over here, but she's underground. So now you dig up the cells to see what she's up to. Oh, here's another one. This is where she is in the daytime. Those are very early morning bees. They only work right at dawn. And in the daytime, they plug the hole. So here's the hole plugged and down inside here 
is the, uh, the cells. So we dig down to those cells. As we go down, we meet her. So here she is, she's got her, this is the end that stings. So she's got her stinger sticking up here to try to deter me as a potential predator coming into her nest. We get further on and here are her cells. There's one there, one there, one there. And there was a tunnel right along here, which gave her access to each one of these cells. Now in the cell that you see right here, that cell looks shiny and wet. It is not shiny and wet. I mean, it's shiny, but it's not wet. It's a coating of wax over the whole surface that she has produced from a wax gland and spread on the mud to keep the water out, to keep fungi out, and keep uh, burrowing insects out. Then she filled us with food, put her egg in it, and here's the couch potato living in this little swamp down here that's nectar and pollen. There it is close up. Here it is exposed. So here's the wax layer. Here's the soup down here. The larvas in the soup here. And this actually is not soup. This is beer. She carries with her yeast and she inoculates this nectar. The yeast eats the nectar and the larval the bee larva eats the yeast. So that's the food system that she sets up, protected by this waxy layer. When the kid gets fully developed, it then pupates. Here's the fully developed one. Pupates inside that waxy layer. Here's the pupa. And here's that one big turd right here, the meconium. That was all the internal waste material the stone, in the gut system that was defecated out at the last minute. Now. Where does she get all that nectar? I said she's an early morning, you see this, all this stuff here. That's a lot of food. She's an early morning bee. She's the first bee to visit the opening flower. And she often does it in the black dark. She knows where the flower is going to open in the black dark. And I would be out there in the black dark and the way I, I can't do that anymore, but there was a time when I could find her by listening. She was very reliable to hover about a foot in the air over the opening flower that she knew was directly below her. She drops into the flower and sticks her tongue down and this is her tongue. It's not just a straw, it's a whole brush. She sticks this brush in and sops up like a sponge, a whole lot of nectar, pulls it in and goes into a crop inside her gut. And then she keeps doing this. So she's harvesting the, the easiest, biggest quantity of fresh food in that fresh flower and other bees come to it later on. She also pollen gets pollen by buzzing the pollen out of those tubular anthers of a different species of plant. And here she is with that pollen grain stuck between those fine hairs. See, here's the fine hairs you can see pretty well, but here they've got a lot of pollen stuck in them. This is a male. This is a male. And right in the middle of the male, is like glued, like with epoxy resin. Remember the fly that had the, the, the sacks of pollen stuck up underneath its nose? This is an orchid who glues the pollen sacks to the back of the bee visiting the orchid. He's visiting the orchid to get chemicals that he uses as attractants for her, not to get nectar. He's visiting the, the orchid to get attractants in his courtship of her. The orchid glues this in his back. He then goes into another orchid and the forked piece strips off the little bag. So you can't, there's no bag here. It's just the base that was epoxy resin onto the back of the bee at the time it visited. Now, just give me a second here. I gotta go get the clock. Okay, now we had a red flower back a ways. Let's go back to it. 
this one. I said to you that the bee, the, the hummingbird comes over here and sticks its bill down between these stiff bristles, like a toothbrush here, right here. And the pollen gets stuck on the top of the hummingbird's head in that process. Okay, so that's, this is a hummingbird pollinated passiflora. And look at the shape of this thing. Petals in a star shape thing, a brush of a material right here. And then here are these, these um, anthers up so they can stick uh, uh, pollen onto the hummingbird's head. This is a photograph early in the morning because later on, these are the stigmas right here. Later on, those stigmas are going to bend downwards. So they're down here. So now when she comes in the middle of the day to get more nectar, the pollen grains are already on top of her head from some other plant. So they then get brushed off onto these sticky stigmas because they're burnt way down here to make bacteria available. Now let's go to this flower. Oops. Same thing, but this is not red. This is white and blue. That's a bee flower. And here are the stigma, uh, the anthers with the pollen on the underside. You can see the little yellow right underneath there. That's the pollen. Here's your more yellow here. That's the pollen grains. And these are the stigmas already bent downwards so that when the bee comes in and he goes around like this, when, sorry, when she comes in and goes around like this, she's gonna leave pollen on the underside of these stigmas. But those in the early morning were up here, not down here. So here's an example from the side. This is an early morning flower. I mean, early morning photograph, early in the morning. So here's the the, the, the um, anthers with the yellow pollen grain on them is going to go on top of the head. Here are the stigmas that are going to bend down. And then in the next photograph, here they are bent down. So we go back and forth between these two. That is plant behavior. This is the only plant at that time. This was the only biology paper for plants in the journal behavior. Since then, there are a lot. But the problem was that animals were viewed as one thing and plants were another thing. And a lot of botanists, a lot of plant people knew that plants have behavior, but they didn't call it behavior. Not realizing really it's the same thing. This is just courtship. This is a dance hall on Saturday night. And here's the pollen grains on the back of the bee from this particular plant right here, from this particular passiflora right here. These are the yellow tubular flowers from which the bee buzzes the pollen, which is carrying on the underside. So you hear this white pollen grain you see right here and the fine hairs, that's been buzzed out of one of these flowers here. There it is close up, you can see the pollen grains very well. And of course, this will be a mixture now from different plants. Now that's mom in her nest with that very curved bill. Many of the tubular flowers that these guys visit require a curved bill to get to the nectar. A straight bill won't get past them because the flower tube is curved. So it, it, the, the bill has to be curved also in order to really get to the nectar. So there she is in her nest. These are the kids underneath. And this was to remind me, each one of those is about the size of my thumbnail. I mean, they're really small. But these are the ones that are getting fed insects and spiders. Some nectar, I'm sure, but the big, the, the bulk of their food is, is protein rich insects. Here's that red tubular flower again. And here you can see the stigmas up here and the anthers uh, down there. Um, same thing, same thing. You know. I mean, I'm going to skip over the, yeah, see the curve here, what I want to do, here's this thing here. For, for you to get to the nectar here, you need to have a curved bill that fits this curve. Now, I mentioned visitors. Whoops. 
Oh my goodness. No, there he is, sure, of course. This is a butterfly sitting on a red tubular flower. So this is a hummingbird flower. And here's the, here's the stigmas out here on the end, getting ready to get, to get the pollen off the hummingbird. But it's having its nectar stolen by a butterfly. By the very long tongues that butterflies have, they can slip that tongue past these structures at the top. So they don't carry pollen and they don't pollinate. So you, people will call this a pollinator. It is not, it's a visitor. Yeah, and there's lots and lots of pollen, of lots and lots of nectar visitors or just visitors to flowers of all kinds. Uh, a number of butterflies are particularly good at this with their long thin tongues. Now, I told you that there are no hummingbirds in the old world. And therefore, a the long transect through the French Alps shows you no red tubular flowers, really. In fact, all of Europe, none except introduced ones in people's gardens. But here we are in West Africa. And this is a native tree. It is obviously covered with red flowers. Here they are close up. What's going on? This is a native tree. It's not somebody's garden tree. There it is close up. And red tubular flowers. However, each of these kinds of plants has the flower pointed downwards. There's a bird called honey eaters in Africa that walks up the stem and sticks its bill upwards into the flower. It doesn't hover in front of the flower like a hummingbird does. It sticks its bill up into it to get the nectar for these. So it's the pollinator. They're sunbirds or nectar birds. It's the pollinator for these vertically positioned flowers. So here we have red, which goes with the bird, but the flower is oriented differently than the New World flowers are for the hummingbirds who are flying to visit rather than walking up the stem. Now, there's one of these trees transplanted and planted in a garden in San Jose, Costa Rica, next to a restaurant. And I'm sitting there in the restaurant eating and looking at the tree. It's covered with red flowers, just, just like that, right? Suddenly realizing that here's this huge red tree with all these red tubular flowers and there are no hummingbirds at all, none. Whereas the garden next door to it is full of hummingbirds, but nobody visits this tree, this red flower tree. What we've since discovered is that the nectar in these flowers here is toxic to hummingbirds, but not to sunbirds in Africa. So in Africa, the chemistry of these flowers is doing something to protect them from somebody. I don't know who that is. And when you move that to the new world, the hummingbirds are impacted by that. So they simply, I'm sure they investigate this. The young hummingbird will certainly go and check this out, but they will decide from tummy ache or from whatever that um, this is not for them when they're all flying around 20 meters away, but they don't go near it. Um, I'm going to skip over that just to contrast this. There's the bee, the bee version of Passiflora, and there's the hummingbird version of Passiflora. Same genus of plants growing in the same habitat in tropical rainforest. Now, look at these for a moment, and you can see that they're, they're symmetrical. The, the, you see, there's, there's one piece here, an anther is here, another anther here, and another anther here. They're arranged around three ways around, and here they're sort of they're, they're dis dis more disorganized over here, but they're sort of arranged around any direction. This is a moth pollinated passiflora that opens at the dark at night and is visited by those big sphinx moths. And they don't land and walk around the flower or hover and go around the flower, they come straight in and go straight out. So what you have here is now all the anthers on just one side and all the stigmas are on one side. And the thing is white for night. 
So what you can see here is that this is the open part of the flower. That's where the tongue would go in. The backside here is closed. So this flower is organized not only for color for a sphinx moth or a flying moth, but also for the orientation of this up in here and the orientation of this hole down here. Now let's move to looking at whole whole plant. This plant is very closely related to uh, catalpa, which is a tree in the eastern United States, right here in Philadelphia. And um, it has the habit of producing continuous flowers during the dry season, two or three months. So you get this kind of thing. Here's new flowers and here's fruits from the previous flowers. So this thing is fruiting and flowering simultaneously. That means it's at the same time, it's maturing the fruit, which is going to be wind dispersed and open up and throw a whole bunch of little wind dispersed seeds. Wind dispersed, when wind develop, I mean, pollen, sorry, fruit development, at the same time, it's attracting pollinators. So here are the pollinators here, and this thing is in continuous flower for, for months. So the pollinators can know where it is, and there will be a set of pollinators who will only go to this tree or this individual tree even, because it's just there and it's big, it's very showy, anybody can find it visible from kilometers away practically, it sticks out on the top of the canopy. Uh, no secrets about this thing at all. This is a totally different thing, but the same family of plants. See all these yellow crowns scattered across the countryside? There they are closer up. Here they are very close. And when you see that, what you know is eight days before, now this is what the local, the, the local knowledge is, eight days before these flower buds all opened, it rained. So the entire population of these trees sit out there with no flowers all during the dry season. And Sometime in the later part of the dry season, it's very hot, a rain occurs, one rain. That triggers everybody. And there they are. Now, everybody thinks that's everybody. In fact, if you're out here and you know these individual trees, you discover that perhaps that's two thirds of the individuals and one third are not responding. That probably means that they burned up their, pre their they didn't store and accumulate enough energy to actually make a whole flower crop so they don't make any. So the next time this happens, that tree will make a flower crop. Okay. But right now, you get a lot synchronized by that single pulse of rain. Well, these are two bees, as you can see one here. Here's the, you can see here's the, the spoon shaped area I was talking about. It's just starting to get some pollen accumulated in it. Here is a huge lump of pollen that's been accumulated. These bees, these are big bees, the size of a bumblebee. They're ones out there visiting a variety of flowers all the, all the time during the dry season or during the rainy season too. But they, all of a sudden when this happens, they abandon the plants that they've been visiting. I'm sure it's visual, but there may be an odor component to this as well, of leaving all the plants they normally visit and focus on this enormous crop of yellow flowers. And for two days, three days, that's all they visit. So they're getting a huge amount of food from a very easy access thing by these things being synchronized. And so they basically suck all the pollinators out of the community. And then they stop flowering. They're all done. Those bees then have to go back to the sort of scattered flowers that they normally visit in the past. So here's the long tongue incidentally on one of those one of those bees. They're both females, of course. And um, uh, so now they'll go back to visiting and pollinating the various plants that they did normally. But what you're happening here is that because they're synchronized, they they pull the whole set. Hummingbirds, bees, flies, all kinds of things come out. And, and oh, and do nothing but deal with this single food source. If the 
MP3s were not synchronized. So it was one here, one there. They wouldn't have that power. Yeah, they would get some pollinators, but they wouldn't pull the whole set. Now, this is a tree in the dry season that's dropped all its leaves. And um, in this tree are a lot of orchids. Here's the old dying bulbs here. This is last year's bulb. This is a fresh new one from this year, which just got nice green leaves on it. So it's a nice healthy orchid. There's another one here. And out of that thing is two things. One is the stem, which has got the flowers on it. So here, these are orchid flowers here. And then one of them made a fruit, which is that thing right there. That fruit will have, oh, a million seeds in it. Now that's only about an inch and a half long, okay? So it's, it's, we're talking about an enormous number of very small seeds. They are dispersed by wind and the vast number of those seeds fall on the ground and die. But some, as did these when they were seeds, landed on tree branch. And on that tree branch, there was a fungus. And the fungus attached to the seedling, which has no food reserves at all. That's why it's extremely small. No food reserves. So it's attached to the, to the uh, tree as a, as a substrate. And then the um, um, fungus and, and grab, effectively grabs a hold of the pollen grain. I mean, of the seed, I'm sorry, the seed, this very small seed. And um, it germinates and the fungus feeds the plant until it grows big enough to have leaves like this. And then it starts to photosynthesize and it feeds some of those resources that it makes from photosynthesis back to the fungus. So these big adults that you see here will all have a strong connection to fungi that are running along the surface of this tree branch, because that's the basic biology. Now, here's what the flowers of that orchid look like close up. And um, right here are two of those yellow sacks that you saw on the underside of a fly. So the fly or some animal, in this case a bee, sticks its proboscis down, in the, down into there and these things are sticky and they get stuck on, on it. And when it pulls back and to go back away from the flower, they end up stuck on the bill or the nose or the tongue or where whatever part of the animal was stuck in there. This is another flower a legume that occurs in the same place. And look at it, purple, yellow, purple, yellow, and white. Purple, yellow, and white. Same size flower, same place. This flower offers nectar to the bee. This flower offers nothing. This is a mimic of that. So the bees that go and visit of this, are trundling along, doing their thing, being attracted to this, sticking their proboscis up in there, getting pollen in, on it and getting nectar and all that sort of thing, a normal thing. And they encounter one of these orchids. And they just go ahead and stick their thing in there, just like the yellow and purple orchid, I mean, the yellow and purple legume flower, the bean, and uh, no reward. But here's that thing. So here's me sticking, a, this is the end of a ballpoint pin stuck in like I'm a piece of a bee. And here's the gluey part here, stuck onto, and here's the sacks of pollen stuck onto the end of my pin. And there I strip off the outer, the outer layer, and here's the little, the little pockets of pollen inside. So here's, like I say, this is the end of a ballpoint pen right here. What's the difference between these three flowers? This one is missing it's pollen. So what happens is, here's one that's just lost its pollen because I just stuck my pen into it. Here's one normal. This guy here tomorrow is going to turn to be this color. And that is going to be, again, attracted this other color to the bee that's got one of these things stuck on it. And when it goes in there, there's a little gluey fork up in the top here, which will strip that pollen sack off and pollinate the flower. So here's, here's, here's the, the uh, here's this one that 
there's one that's untouched. Here's one where the pollen, the pollen sacs are gone. And here's one where the plant now is responding to the being gone by having another one stuck on it. So one of these guys here has been stuck on here. And now this is the growing fruit. It's starting to go, this is germinating. And we'll go down into the fruit, which will be this piece right here will develop into the fruit. So here in this case, four of those flowers of the orchid got pollinated. Here's what the pollen, here's what the seeds look like. When I said they're very, very small, okay, every one of these yellow dots is an orchid seed. But here's one of the flower, here's one of the fruits, and I've just dumped out a bunch of the seeds which are inside here. There they are close up. As you can see, they carry no reserves at all. It's just, just, just a, a shell with the genes. Now, what we did was ask a question. Unfortunately, let's see if I can. I can't remove this thing so I can see. Oh well. I'm trying to, I can't see what's up there on the top, but you can, but I can't see it. Um, oh, yeah, if I re, well, let's see. Uh, what I was going to point out to you is that if the plant gets only one father for one fruit. Or no, it gets yeah, one, one flower, either zero or one father. It makes this number of, of fertile fruits or this number of fertile fruits. If it gets more than one, it makes this number. So what it's doing is deciding the quality of the pollination process. If there's more pollen for more offspring, for more, I'm sorry, more mates, more males, then it's going to make more fruit. Okay. Let's leave it at that. This is a banana plantation. Costa Rica. This is where your breakfast bananas come from. All of this. It used to be rainforest, of course. Now it's all wrong. So we go down into those, and here's what a banana plant looks like. Bananas are from the old world. They're not new world. They're from Southeast Asia. And um, here's the bananas you buy in the grocery store here. And then there's all this gadget down here. If we look underneath these things here, what you're looking at is the equivalent of sepals. And here is the growing young banana. Here is the stigma. The um, pollen grains are available underneath here. So here is the banana and there's the stigma. So these are female flower. The banana is a female flower, basically. And it makes seeds. These are wild bananas, not the ones that you buy, because the ones you buy in the grocery store are basically all clones from one split up genome. So here's the male flowers here. Here's the female flower, which is going to make a banana. There are the male flowers. Now, see this long stem coming down from here? Way up above is this. The bananas are up here. The female flowers are up here. The male flowers are down here. These are bat pollinated. So the bat comes, sticks his nose up into the male flowers down here, it gets covered with pollen. Then he goes up here next to the female flowers to get nectar and in the process puts pollen on those stigmas. The stigmas were available back when this thing was a little short thing and didn't have any pollen on it. So they this pollen that those stigmas got up here would have come from some other banana plant. But this grows and grows and grows and keeps making male flowers, male flowers, male flowers, and then for months. So it's acting as a father for a long time, acting as a mother for a short time. So you can see what's going to happen here is that this one plant is going to sire many offspring, many bananas out over the whole countryside, but itself is only going to make a few bananas. And as I say, from a mixture of pollen that comes from different things. The outcome of this whole process is that if there's just, let's say, two banana plants, one here and one two feet away or five feet away, 
So all the pollen that gets to this one right here is just from this one over here. There's a high chance that this one over here is one of her offspring. And she will reject making fertile fruits from that offspring. So what happens is in this kind of pollination is, is that in general terms, the more different the pollen is from your own genome, the more likely you are to put all your resources into making a lot of fruits with nice good seeds in them. This has been the bane of fruit orchards. And it turns out there's a very big literature in the 20s and 30s uh, in agricultural journals about this problem. Because you're the apple grower, the plum grower, the peach grower, whatever it happens to be. You go out there on the 1920 uh, and you look at your orchard in the spring after the flowers have taken place and there's a gazillion little green apples in the tree or peaches or plums or any kind of these stone fruits. And you think, wow, I'm gonna have a terrific crop this year. So he'll invest money, he'll make loans out from the bank and do all kinds of things anticipating this big crop. Four weeks later, he goes back through his orchard and there's only six apples per tree. What it turns out was that because the whole orchard is related to each other, mom dumped, aborted nearly all her kids because they turned out to be close relatives. So they quickly learned the value of having within the, within the orchard other genomes. But if you put other genomes, then you get different stra strains of apples or peaches. So you're caught here because what you want is you want the, oh, it's just the right kind of apple or the right kind of peach or whatever it is, but you simultaneously want a big crop. And to get a big crop, you have to have variety in the genomes. So those varieties of genomes bring other genes that affect flavor and color and size and all that sort of stuff. So there's a, it was a lot of questions and a lot of experiments to try to figure out how to solve that particular problem. And it all comes from the fact that these things in their mating and their courtship, of course, are sensitive, just as animals are, to who their closest relatives are. So we'll stop right there. And um, that's where we are. And next, next time, we're going to talk about the next lecture, which is the last lecture. We're going to dig into the seeds themselves uh, that are produced by this um, courtship with flowers. Okay, we'll stop there.